Okay, welcome back. It's time now for Off the Press, where we look at the headlines on uh, the front pages of our national dailies. Today we'll be looking at uh, basically two newspapers, The Punch and The Guardian, and if we are able to lay our hands on another one, uh, we will continue uh, to bring you the um, headlines. But for now, we're being joined by our usual guest on this day, uh, architect Ezekiel Nyaitok, a public affairs analyst. Um, I hope he's talking to us from Aquarium this morning. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Hi, good morning. Nice to be here. Okay. You're talking to us from Aquarium, right? Um, no. Okay. A little further, further away. <laughs> okay. All right. So you have missed the happy hour for this week. All right. Thank uh, you. Now, uh, let's begin with uh, what's on the Punch newspaper. Uh, the leading headlines is uh, contribu contributory pension. NLC retirees lament as 26 states fail to join scheme. And the riders on that story are that uh, Lagos, five others in full compliance, contributory pension scheme inevitable, says Pencom, and then withholding pension immoral, says NLC, retirement now debt sentence, retirees kick. Let's hear your comments on this headline, please. Okay. Um, the issue of pension, I don't think that our government really understands and appreciates the concept of pension. The concept of pension is not to give government money. But to know that after somebody has worked for a certain number of years, he stops working when it is agreed that he can no longer be effective and efficient at working for more reasons than one. What that means is that that person has to have a certain means of livelihood that can continue to have a reasonable life till the end of time. So the bottom line in pension schemes is the welfare and the well-being and the appreciation to a great extent of the effort that these people have put in over the past almost 30, 35 years. But what do we find? We find a situation where there is such opacity, lack of transparency, there is no good conscience towards the management of the funds of the people in the larger interest of the workers. Rather, the workers have to suffer to be able to get their pensions and their gratuity. Now, over the years, when there have been these deductions from the salaries of the workers, the government deducts the money, but they do not transmit the deductions to the pool, which is what we have even in the area of national housing funds. You have people having their deductions made religiously. But when you go back to ask for the money that you have so that you'll be able to do certain types of businesses or even if you don't want to do businesses you'll be able to have that money generating income for you and you feed on the proceeds for the rest of your life those things are not there as a result workers are starting to ask themselves some very pertinent questions one of which is What's the wisdom in my continuing to be a part of this system? And they want to opt out. I know what it took some of us to be able to be part of the realignment of the National Housing Fund so as to buy the, 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 the buy-in of different states to come back to the scheme. And right now, there is that related transparency so so many states are starting to come on board but this contributory pension scheme 
I think that the way forward is for the government to be able to let all the workers know why it is in their better interest for them to continue to contribute. Pension funds form a very, very, very large bulk of monies that can be deployed in ways that will guarantee returns on the investment and the security of the fund. Those two core functions. There are certain investments, long-term infrastructure that you can do where such is guaranteed to be very, very transparent and accountable. You know? So I think these are basically the concerns. The moment we start to see pension funds and what should be managed in the larger interest of the pensioners and not what you can use and get money from, and the workers have um, no great idea of how it's being run. I think those are just because I've, I've interrogated very, very, very much with workers on this subject matter, and they just don't see the end from the beginning. The moment that is done is a scheme that is very necessary, absolutely necessary for every country, but it's a scheme that must be run based on confidence of the workers. Yeah, and I, I think it's not only the government that is to blame. Some private institutions as well, uh, they deduct these monies from their uh, workers, but they do not remit it to where the appropriate quarters so that these people can access their pension uh, fund when they need this pension fund. But I'd also like you to remember that the government even borrows from pensions money while the pensioners themselves you. do not have this money. It's weird. You, you see, this is... This is the, the fundamental. Government should not primarily see pensions as a source of funds for them. No. They should see it primarily as what you manage for a reward of a man that might not be able to work. Now, how does it think of it? How does it feel that a man gives 30 or woman? 30 or 35 years of her or his life and at retirement is blind, does not have an idea of exactly what she has or what is possible. From time you must operate a very transparent system of communicating with the contributors. So progressively, they can see how their funds are building up, also enlightening them on the possibilities of the utilization of those funds on their retirement, so that they retire into comfort. And, you know, the comfort is not in terms of, you know, opulence or luxury. There, there is that, you know, when you talk of later of comfort, there is that assurance, there's a certainty that they can live the rest of their life with, with relative certainty on financial. Mm. So, and also any private sector that undertakes such, the government must ensure that it is obligatory, mandatory, compulsory for them to create a platform of transparency where the workers that they deducted their salaries from see exactly what their entitlements are, and those entitlements must be guaranteed by government policy. Mm. Well, talking about government, it brings us to the next uh, uh, headline here, which is on the new boss of the anti graft agency, uh, EFCC. He says, anti graft war should start from the National Assembly. You remember he has just been uh, uh, given the nod, he has been passed by this uh, National Assembly that he could be the chairman of EFCC. He has been confirmed as chairman of EFCC. And the first statement he has made is that the fight against this corruption has to start from the National Assembly. We do hope that this will not put him in 
a bad light in such a way that he will be disgraced out of office as well. Because as one of the eggheads said, uh, corruption has a way of fighting back. Because we've seen past um, uh, EFGC chairs that have been disgraced out of office. Some of them, we know that we were doing some investigations into matters that concerned very big names in our country. And for instance, Bauer, who is the immediate past, we hear he has resigned. How the conditions for those, that resignation, we do not know. But he's still in uh, jail, as it were, more than 100 days after he was put there, which was not supposed to be, which is not supposed to be. It's supposed to be 24 hours. But 24 hours has dragged into months upon months. So this is what he has said. I do not know what your comments are on that. National Assembly should be the place that anti-graft war should begin. You see, I, I listen to those, um, do I use the word commentaries or remarks? And um, I... You know, if you know how some of these things work, the president has the higher and higher prerogative. The National Assembly can only confirm. Mm. For him to, and after confirming, there's nothing they can do again. Okay, effectively. You know, there was a situation where the National Assembly refused to confirm an EFCC boss and the president refused to change the person. And the person was there for over four years. The only difference is you call the person acting chairman. And acting chairman is long. So people who don't these people call the acting chairman. They continue to call him chairman. So stop. Mm. Confirmed or not confirmed. So for that guy to make that statement at a time where the National Assembly had the power to deny him. And he told them that, I'm going to start from here. I think he's very, very bold and audacious. Mm. And he probably knows what we don't know. And then um, at the end of the day, he was still confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> so even when you had the knife and the yam, you could not cut. Now that the uh, both the knife and the yam have left. And uh, because the chairman is, is the yam and the president is the knife. So the president gave you his knife to cut the yam. And now that you've confirmed it, you have handed the, the knife back to the president. So the yam is intact. Well, you can and go, then, you can go I, back I as a rat. Well. You can go back as a rat and eat <laughs> that yam. I think it's I said you can go back as a rat and eat that yam because officially they couldn't have done anything. <laughs> but this, no, you are right. Because <laughs> possibility. Yeah. All they need to do, you're very right, because if it starts to put heat on them, they will now go back as a rat by threatening Mr. President with impeachment. If he does not remove them. So there are many ways or threatening with delay of the budget or threatening so they can actually go back as rats. You know? Then why do you want to go back as hard when you had the knife to cut the yam? <laughs> but there was really nothing to cut because the guy had done nothing to them. But I think it was very bold of him, very audacious for him to say it in front of them, there and then, before the confirmation, mm -hmm. that this battle will start from here. National Assembly. And um, on a serious note, I found out, I found that quite uh, reassuring, and uh, people say talk is cheap. But the Bible says a man is ensnared by the words of his mouth. Say it. Whether talk is cheap or just say it. Start from saying it. You know. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. Go ahead. I lost your audio for the moment then. I had effectively landed that. I, I thought you wanted to take another item or something. No, 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 no. Okay, but, but we, can, we can go to the other, another headline, still on the National Assembly. Uh, now, we've seen some kind of brohaha within the National Assembly, but the Senate President has visited the President and said there is 
no conflict at all in the National Assembly. So this headline is saying, uh, Akwabio, that is the Senate president, meets Tinubu, dismisses crisis in the Senate. Remember that a few uh, days ago, uh, they, they, yeah. one of the assembly members, or not assembly, the Senate yeah. members, staged a walkout Senate. because of what uh, happened yeah. in the National Assembly. But now he's saying... Being, no, being, the no one problem. that overruled was now being overruled. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, do you believe that um, what Akwabio is saying is really true? Don't you see a crack in, of some sort in the National Assembly? You see, sometimes we over-sensationalize certain issues. Politics is a game of interest and intrigue. There's a saying in our language that, you know, this might not be understood by the young people because it's no longer a tradition. In those days, the tradition was for the father to marry a wife for the, especially the husband, which is like the first son. That was the tradition then. So, this husband is a father who is not uh, forthcoming. So, he now devises a means of, uh, you know, just the politics of um, trying to play with the father's favorite wife, you know? And the father will notice, and like, oh boy, look at this boy, he's starting to look at my wife for. I better marry wife for him so that he will leave my wife alone. You understand me? Mm. So if the husband does not uh, pretend to be looking at the father's favorite wife, the father may not marry a wife for him. So sometimes some of the intrigues that you find in the National Assembly is not on account of a crisis, but to create a negotiation platform. And sometimes the negotiation that they have in mind has not even come to the fore yet. But um, the you know politicians are very, very, very. Let me use the word crafty. They are what IBB was described. I think it was the one that he described himself as an evil genius. You know, if you know what politicians do, they are ingenuous. I hope they can bring such level of ingenuity into governance. Politicians know how to win elections. They know what to do. I'll tell you this. One of my friends was telling me of a guy that was extremely popular and was sure of winning an election. So what they did was overnight before the election, they jumped his friends, you know, they sprinkled the blood of a goat, you know, near the fence. And first thing in the morning, as early as uh, 6 a.m., they stormed this out with police men. That the man was carrying out rituals. That they should go and see that blood somebody. So they went and actually saw the blood. So they took the man for interrogation. The man was there for interrogation until the election was over. Wow. And at the end of the day, the results came back, the supposed results. Okay, sorry, we have um, done a, a research on it, and we discovered that it's not a human blood, but the blood of animals. So, sorry, you can go. He was released to go, but guess what? Election does finish. And the other uh, opponent had won. So, you can see how ingenious that politicians can be. And then um, the same applies to the National Assembly. So I wouldn't be one of those saying that there's, there are any cracks in the National Assembly. Rather, I would say that the games of interest are playing out. I would like to commend the, the Senate President. He's a very skilled person in managing situations. Don't forget that this guy was my governor for eight years. And within that period, if you go back to a quiet bomb today, he remains Apart from architecture bombs being to attack, that is loved naturally for more reasons than one. Outside of that, there's a certain charisma and charm that Mr. Fabio brings to the table. And he does that, and he's also a man that reaches out. 
You'll be surprised that at night he goes to these people. So he won, he has a way of warming himself to the hearts of the people. But that will not stop politicians from bringing things, especially when things don't go their way, and there's no way that things will go everybody's way. Okay. Uh, pol politics, uh, talking about politics, we're, we're going out to Ondo State as it is. Ondo Assembly asked Ayode Tiwa to withdraw suits. Uh, the deputy governor of Ondo State has been under fire, even though we don't know where the governor himself is, his whereabouts, we don't know, and lawyers have come out to say that uh, he can govern from anywhere because the Constitution gives him that power, or at least doesn't stop him from governing the state from anywhere. So he can be in the UK, he can be in America, he can be in China or Afghanistan and, uh, and govern the state. So that is what the Constitution allows, according to some of the uh, legal luminaries that we've heard talking. But right now, because of the intervention of the uh, APC, uh, National Executive Committee or the National Working Committee, uh, the Assembly members are not talking about impeachment anymore. But right now they are telling the deputy governor to withdraw all the suits that he had instituted in uh, the courts. Yeah, you see, the Bible says that all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. I, I find it very lame, the argument that you can govern from everywhere. Of course you can govern from everywhere. And um, then you should ask yourself, is that the best in the interest of the generality of the people? Is government about you or about the people? You know, we have brought ourselves to a level in this country where Nigeria is one man called Tinubu, and then your state is one man called your government. And we live for four to six, eight years on the whims and caprices of that one person. And the person moves either 200 million people as the president, or depending on the population in your area, quite well, about a little over 7 million people. And that's wrong. That's not okay. Now, we all human, we're all human, and we know that anybody can be incapacitated health-wise. And we pray for such people to get their health back as for more reasons than one. Apart from governance, the governor needs to have to enjoy his life as a healthy person. But if for any reason, in the interim, there is this situation, what should you really do with all good conscience? It's clear that you should do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If you were on the other side of the table, how would you feel if a man is incapacitated, one way or the other, and then he insists on being there? And I think the National Assembly should actually go back and look at this concept of joint speaking, this concept of vice president or deputy governor and make sure that they make that office to be effective and, you know, functional. And, you see, when, when you as a deputy governor, you should also know that your primary objective is supportive. We know the administration of, you know, uh, um, uh, good of Jonathan. We don't remember Sambo who was there. We talk of the administration of the immediate past president, uh, President Buhari. We talk of the administration of OBJ. So you as a deputy governor, you must know that that is not your administration. It's the administration of your principal. So you must give your principal the highest level of loyalty even when he's not on the seat. You don't go and show on you, uh, you know, ambition and then start to pass or display acts of disloyalty. But, if but somebody is, did is that this is this really ambition? When you were held incapacitated, is this really ambition? Is, will you be happy? 
I don't know. If, is this really ambition? So, if the governor is absent and there is a deputy governor, yeah. it is believed that he should step yeah. into the shoes and do the needful. But this seems, oh, it keeps looking like there are people who know uh, that if the deputy governor steps into those shoes, maybe there are some things that he shouldn't know. And they don't want the state to be governable for him. They want the governor, wherever he is, to still be at the helm of affairs so that they can control whatever is happening. Because the governor cannot, cannot superintend over things when he is not present. So there are people who are doing that for him, and it's not the deputy governor. Should this even be? If the is deputy it, governor can be treated it, like this, what's the point on having a deputy governor and not just have aides that you can send? Let me, let me tell you something. One of the laws that we should have, in my opinion, is that if you have been a deputy governor, you cannot participate in an election that comes immediately after your tenure. When we do that, we will start to have deputy governors that concentrate on the work. Because deputy governors, rather than supporting their leaders, see it more as a springboard for them to launch their ambition. Mm. So what I want to propose, and I want National Assembly to consider, is that if you have been a deputy governor, you cannot participate by in that in running that office. If 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 your your principal goes for a second term and wants to continue with you, no problem. They know that when you people complete your eight years, you cannot run for the office of the governor until a tenure has expired. Mm. If they do that then deputy governors will concentrate on supporting their principles, which is supposed to be their primary role. And there will never a time where you step into your shoes as a deputy governor, even when your principal is incapacitated. Hmm. You step into his shoes, except by way of death, where you can now be the one you know, to go or resignation. But so long as that man is still alive, even if you see, the shoes are not yours. The shoes are the governor elect uh, shoes. But can this thing happen in other climes where you are outside your state for so long because of illness and you still hold on to power? That is incapacitation if, as far as I'm concerned. You cannot sit I, in your I office, understand, you cannot stay. I understand and that. you're still there clinging on to power. Why are we like this? Anyway, let's... Let me tell you, let me tell you what it is. Yeah. Because we do not see governance as a platform of service. We see it as a platform of reward. What am I talking about? There are two sets of people. Number one is the principal himself. And number two is the people that were responsible for bringing him into office. So even when the principal is incapacitated, those who brought him to office, who had had certain understandings with him, don't want another person to come in. Mm. And that is why we need to interrogate our electoral processes. Cabal. Why must we allow people to, to feel themselves to become governor? Why can't we as individuals simplify the process by, okay, look at America. We keep talking America. I keep giving this example. Donald Trump is a globally acknowledged billionaire in dollars. The you and I know that the average Americans were considering that $5, their $10, their account was being shown, and on a weekly basis, they were con contributing money to run the election. As a result, Donald Trump cannot say, you guys know that I brought out my money and this is so stay away. Or the powerful group, the lobby group, in fact, they should, there's supposed to be a law that limits how much people contribute, you know, to elections. 
But you know that is absolute, absolute, uh, I don't even know, I don't want to use a, an offensive word. You know? Why do we have laws that just don't make any meaning whatsoever? Okay. They tell you that as, as a governor, you cannot spend more than, uh, say, five billion. You know? Initially, it was even one billion. And you know that I've run governorship. I know how much personal money I brought in. You know, and you know that by the time you talk of five billion, you're looking like Boy Scouts. What is that? Nobody's listening to what is what is one billion? What is that? Is that for Senate? Yeah. Even senators are spending two, three billion in a quiet All right. Um you know? let, let well, let's just take only one question from, from the Guardian newspaper. We've seen uh, not question, rather, a headline. We've seen politicians <laughs> leverage Electoral Act loopholes to evade scrutiny. We, that one is self-explanatory. We've been talking about this all the time. U.S. vetoes, U.N. resolution to cease fire in the Middle East, allies snub Biden. And China commits to re refinancing competition of Abuja, Kano, Portakot, Medjugri railways. But worries that Naira slums further to 1,100 Naira to a dollar in official market. We have one minute to talk about this and go wrap up, please. Let me, let me tell you something. Sometimes I find certain things infuriating. Mm. I find certain discussions very difficult mm. because you have seen a car catching fire. Simple wisdom says Bring fire extinguisher and turn off the fire. Then we're sitting down and having conversations, having discussions, having all sorts of things to talk about the fire. By the time that we are through, the house is, or the car, or whatever, is completely burnt down. The issue of this mirage is so simple and straightforward. Question number one, where is the problem? Where the demand exceeds the demand for dollars, exceeds the supply of dollars. Dollar exchange rate will go up. There is no other economist in the whole world that will tell you something different from what this simplistic architect has said. So what are we asking ourselves? Where do we get dollars from? Mm. To be a number two, how can we stop the demand for dollars? It's simple. Where do we get dollars from? And how do we stop the demand for dollars? Those mm. two discussions. Okay. Let's take the second part. How do we stop the demand for dollars? Why Let, do we demand dollars? Let's be brief about it, please. I will tell you number one. Mm. Speculation. Nigerians are starting to exchange Naira for dollar to keep. Why are they doing that? Because they believe that the dollar is going to keep rising so that their Naira is going to become worthless and they are starting to justify it and say that's correct. What will a reasonable government do? They will try to attack that mentality viciously by looking for ways to control and stop the further slide. Okay. And then even give people the body language that is going to start coming down. Okay, we may have to save this. There we may have to save this discussion. Um, that the dollar came down from. 900 to 700. We may have to save Correct. this discussion for another day, architect. Uh, because, um, yes, sir. yes, please. I, I think this discussion should take a whole, a whole lot of time uh, than this. But you've set the precedent. Yes. Um, we need to uh, stop whatever we need to stop. We need to uh, make sure that the dollar. Doesn't you call another hard. program. Yes, yes, we'll put it on another <laughs> program now. It's too, time is too short for it's that. Okay. But I'd like to thank you this morning for coming on the show. And, thank uh, you. Yes, thank you. We do, we do hope to meet again next week 
on uh, the show. Okay. Mm. Thank you so much. Yes. Thanks for the privilege. God yes. bless you. You too. We've been talking with architect uh, Ezekiel Nyaitoke, a public affairs analyst, and we were looking at the headlines. Our break will be very short, and then when we return, we'll be looking at the fact that 94% of elected offices await tribunal, and INEX credibility has sunk to the lowest low. Stay with us. <laughs>